Hi everyone, thank you for joining us again today for Find My Past at Home. Today's conversation is going to be about searching for your LGBT ancestors. And we are gonna give you some hints, some tips for records to look at, and just a general conversation about what it means for our ancestors to be LGBT at different times in history. So during our conversation today, we have Jill Rossini, who is the author of Same Sex Love, 1700 to 1957. It's a history and a research guide. Um, fantastic book if you are interested in just general queer history. I absolutely recommend picking it up. The book is full of really unique stories um, and ways to uncover um, these interesting stories through history and different records to look at as well. Also, Jill is, uh, has been teaching family and social history since 1988. Uh, she is a regular contributor to Who Do You Think You Are magazine. And most recently, Jill has written a history of women's lives in Liverpool. So um, if you have questions about Liverpool as well, definitely please bring those forward. So during today's conversation, I uh, please ask questions, give us comments, send us some feedback. We hopefully will be taking questions during the conversation. Uh, we have our um, assistant, our uh, social media person on site with Ellie, who is gonna be helping kind of monitor the comments, sending links through as well for anything that we're talking about. So I just wanna introduce now, uh, Jill Rossini is joining us. Thank you, Jill, for Hello. joining us. Hello, Mary, I'm delighted Hello. to be here. Thank you for having me. Great, thanks. Uh, can I ask where, where exactly are you joining us from today? I'm actually in uh, right on the very end of South Manchester and the border of Cheshire. Uh, which is where I grew up. Uh, so I'm very much a, a Northwesterner, but uh, have lived in Yorkshire for 10 years mm -hmm. and also in uh, Wales for 10 years. And it was actually Wales where uh, we pioneered, uh, I think what was probably their very first ever uh, queer course, which was uh, a lifelong learning course in 2008 on LGBT history and culture. So uh, it's a pioneering going on out there as well. Excellent. And who was that with, that course? Uh, that was the uh, University of Aberystwyth, mm -hmm. and um, it was through their lifelong learning uh, facility. And um, it was probably, as I say, I think the first thing they'd ever done along those lines that was independent, as opposed to just a segment or a part of a bigger mm -hmm. course. Uh, and uh, I also, because uh, there was a time when women's history is a subject, which is kind of a sort of I suppose, in a sense, a sister genre to LGBT history was um, somewhat laid fallow for lots of universities. And I was responsible for reviving that at Aberystwyth as well. So uh, I suppose you could say that my interest has always been in people who have been regarded in some way as um, marginalised or transgressive mm -hmm. or, or in some way uh, not perceived as necessarily equal to other people in society in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, I think we have we have a lot of common there. My uh, my background was I did a history degree in Irish history, but specifically looking at Irish women's history at the University of Belfast, uh, no, Queen's University of Belfast. And um, yeah, it's that idea of looking for these marginal stories, trying to bring them back into the main focus of history. And I, I think I want to um, I want to jump right in and talk about your your book, Same Sex Love: uh, History and Research Guide. I have it, I have it sitting here with me now. Um, so uh, yes, yeah, yeah, get it online. Absolutely. Uh, we hopefully send maybe a couple of links into the chat for where you can pick these up at. Um, but yeah, I guess uh, give us a little bit of background about where why you decided to write the book. Uh, what kind of support did you get for the book as well? Right, well, it, this actually was my labour of love, and it was the book that I originally wanted to write when I approached the publisher, which was Pen and Sword, um, in what would it be about 2013. And um, one of the things I've noticed about family history, and things have changed a lot, probably over the last five or six years, is that it's tended to be quite conventional. Um, whereas things like uh, working class history, labour history, women's history, all those sort of subgenres of social history that have emerged uh, in the post-war period have tended to be quite wide ranging in their appeal. Um, they, I think LGBT history has not really touched family history for, for an awful long time. And it's tended to be what is usually known as quite heteronormative. 
And, and there's often been an assumption amongst family historians that um, because their, all their relatives were married, then none of them could possibly have been cross-dressers, homosexual, bisexual, or to use our modern labels, anything like that. Mm -hmm. And that clearly is not the case. Uh, and, and I suppose in a sense, I just wanted to really wake up the family histories community to the notion that not everybody was what we would label as heterosexual uh, in, in a normative relationship uh, and or was happy with that. And that there are a whole range of people within a family that need exploring. So it's a very personal quest really. And I suppose you could say at the bottom line is I was out to queer family history. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think once I'd cut my teeth on the adoption history that I wrote, uh, and I've sort of proved with that that I could handle a sensitive subject well, uh, and I believe I did with that book, uh, then Pencil were willing to give me a go mm -hmm. at doing the LGBT history book. Uh, and I was really, I was proud of Pen and Sword for doing that. Uh, and I'm proud of the book. Uh, because I think it's 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 not one of those things that's ever going to be a massive bestseller, but in its own quiet little way, I do feel it's made a difference. So it's been a long-term project of mine, um, and um, I feel now that not not necessarily what I do, but the idea of otherness in family history is starting to come forward a bit more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's excellent. I think. Um you know, don't sh sell yourself short, you know, about being a bestseller. So we've got over a hundred people viewing at the moment. So we're make sure that everybody picks up your book. Uh, I just, I think uh, one of the things I just want to mention, pull out a, a quote from from the book. Um, I think that you, it's really powerful how you celebrate the diversity of relationships. You know, as much as, you know, this, the, the book's titled Same Sex Love, but it's also just about all kinds of relationships. Um, so, yeah. you know, that perhaps through this kind of, uh, like you said, queering family history or, you know, celebrating otherness, that we can, you know, recognize diversity of relationships and history and celebrate those. And you also go on to say that, you know, that, uh, I'm trying to find the quote, <laughs> the widest, widest spectrum of relationships between people of the same gender, that there were romantic relationships, there's passionate friendships, there's passionate sexual relationships, but then there's passionate, you know, asexual relationships as Absolutely. well. Yeah. And during a, a conversation we had last week with um, Justin Bengry and, and for a part of a Find My Past at Home, we had a similar conversation about, you know, uh, there could be times where you have uh, two women that live together, um, in some cases they even bury together. We can't say, it's hard for us to define, you know, an 18th century relationship in modern terms to say, were they a lesbian couple? I don't know, but you have to recognize that it, that is an intense and passionate relationship. If you have two women that later want to actually be buried together after living together for 30, 40 years, um, yeah. you know, as, as much as, and like you said, you know, the family history has been very heteronormative and it, it's built out of that tradition as well. Heraldry is to claim the family line and to look at the bloodline and items like that. But we're, you know, it's a new world and we're looking at it from a modern perspective. So I think you can add these kind of passionate relationships into your family tree without diluting it in any way. You're actually enhancing it um, and making it more colorful, adding a rainbow to your tree. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And, you know, I think that there's a, there's a, there's a, a sort of um, a disparity really between how we tend to see people in the past and how we are trying to abandon labels today for people. You know, we talk about spectrums of transgender. We talk about people being on a spectrum of sexuality, if you go along with the Kinsey uh, theory. And and yet we tend to think of ourselves uh, in or people in the past as being, were they homosexual? Were they mm -hmm. bisexual? Why would we want to label people in the past like that if people today don't want to be labeled like that? You know, people can come out today as a, an asexual romantic. Uh, so that doesn't mean to say that they may never have a sexual relationship with the person that they fall in love with. Uh, and sexuality and gender, family relationships are very, very complex. And one of the things that we don't want to do, uh, and this applies to two women or two men who live together, uh, but 
may or may not have slept, shared a bed, we don't know, uh, is that we don't want to label them as a certain thing. Because for one thing, they didn't have labels for themselves. Mm -hmm. They might not have known. If you said to some a man in 1750 in Birmingham uh, who was looking for a sexual partner uh, one Friday evening or something like that, that he was homosexual or, or uh, he was uh, a sodomite or anything like that, he'd go, what? I'm, I'm just mm -hmm. out here looking for some company. I don't know what you're mm -hmm. talking about. Um, so it's the two things, isn't it? We can't apply labels we don't want to people in the past. And also, we can't apply labels to them that they just wouldn't have understood. They were just trying to get by and live their lives. Yeah, I think uh, talking about labels and really talking about terminology there, I think is really is key. Um, you know, words that we use today, for example, the word homosexual wasn't actually even a, a used word until about mm. 18, I think it was 1868, where it originated in, in Prussia. Um, so it would have taken time to become part of an, an average vernacular, an average person yeah. to know what that even means in the first place. So you do have going back further, you know, cold, coded language and different terms for for these kind of relationships, people that are called inverts or um, sapphists. And you have um, homophile love and homogenic love. And you have all these different types of words used Um ultimately for, for things that we have a different language for today. So I think, yeah, I think we need to balance putting labels on, on people in the past. Um, Daphne has added a comment here saying, why do we need to put labels uh, on ourselves? And I think that's a, a very meta question there that we could get into <laughs> and have a long I mean, conversation a about that. Um, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, we shouldn't have to, um, you know, put everybody into tiny boxes. And I think that's where these conversations and, and what Find My Pass is doing this month for LGBT History Month is really unique and, and celebrating those outlining relationships that don't always yeah. need to be labeled, but should be acknowledged and celebrated in their own way. Yeah. I, I want to jump into some of the comments here. And I think Beth has a really uh, interesting comment that I think could, that could take up the whole conversation. Um, it would be interesting to see. So Beth says it would be interesting to see if I can find any documentary proof of any members of my family who were part of the LGBT community, though no evidence or hints that any, anyone was currently. So I think Beth's conversation. <laughs> I knew one day this would happen, uh, <laughs> that we would have a dog start barking during this call. Oh my gosh. So the I'm Amazon calling. <laughs> Don't worry, it's be my turn next. I've got two dogs next door. <laughs> oh, so I'm going to try and ignore that, but I'll let you, Jill, jump in and start uh, answering that question. Well, I, I think um, it, it's quite interesting because what, what Beth's actually saying is uh, she wants to find out uh, some documentary proof of um, family members who were part of the LGBT, LGBT community, but there's no evidence or hints that anyone actually was. So I think my answer to you, Beth, probably would be, I wouldn't worry about it until you've got cause to, to go looking. Um, you know, it's a bit like, um, I'm, I'm part Jewish, and um, one of the things in the, in the Jewish family history community um, is that what you should never do is assume that somebody is Jewish without actually um, having some documentary evidence. Uh, and I think if there is no evidence that anybody in the family was uh, LGBT, as we would now describe them, then I think really the thing to do is rather than go looking for it, is to actually just wait and see how things unfold. Um, and, you know, if you read around the subjects and you've clearly got an interest in it, uh, and you know what sources to use and you know what the provisos are, you know what the um, challenges can be of um, family history uh, in relation to queer subjects, then you will be ready to research it if needs be. Um, what I would say, rather than looking for LGBT, um, what should we say, presences in your family history, is look at things like um, relationships between people of the same gender um, rather than looking for something that is a queer relationship if you like and this also goes back to what was the uh, the person who was saying about why 
Do we need to put labels on ourselves? Exactly. You know, we don't want to put labels on anybody. And that was the whole point of my book, really. I was trying to strip down same-sex relationships in the past, literally to people who felt for each other. That's the whole point. And so I think probably what you will find, Beth, is that you will have uh, best friends for, let's let's say, I mean, I, I'm a Lancashire girl, essentially, uh, and it probably applies to a lot of the north of England and other working class areas as well. And I had an Auntie Vera, and she lived next door to us when I was little. And lots of people in working class areas had an auntie next door. No relation whatsoever. But she may have been the most important person to your grandmother, to your great grandmother, to uh, some female member of the family, the person she confided in, the one that she would talk about relationships with, the one that she would help out and who would help her. That is essentially a same sex relationship. Some researchers, uh, such as Lillian Faderman, would say that is a lesbian relationship in that. It is a close, even intense relationship between two women. So there will be same-sex relationships in your family history, uh, Beth, and there will be same-sex relationships in everybody's family history on that level. In the book, I was talking about two soldiers from the First World War who had a really deep and close friendship. They were both heterosexual men. One of them was my grandfather, actually. And um, he was the one who died. And when he died and his friend who'd seen him through the First World War and they'd stayed in touch and they loved each other. They really loved each other. When my grandfather died in 1940 of war-related uh, injuries, his friend came to the funeral. And my auntie told me that he sat and sobbed like a baby because the man that he loved regardless of his own wife and children, everything else, the man that he loved had died. Now, that's the sort of relationship you'll find in every family. Well, that's incredible. That's a, thank you for, for sharing such a personal story as well. Um, yeah, it's, again, going back to the idea of looking at these wider network of relationships um, and you know, what they mean, you know, they might not be a direct, you know, ancestor, but they meant a lot to, to, to your own ancestor. So absolutely, um, yeah. you know, they deserve their story to be told and acknowledged as well. Um, I, I, here's a question for you, Mary, because, you know, I, I know a lot of um, uh, online family tree recording mechanisms now are starting to acknowledge same-sex couples, but um, I'm just wondering what uh, websites like Family Pass could do to allow um, a genealogist to record uh, and display those non-familial chosen family relationships. I think that would be quite a challenge. And there's often quite very important to um, queer people, to LGBT people who, for whatever reason, are estranged from family. The, the idea of chosen family that you build your own family unit. So is there a way that we could record those families. Sorry, Jill, these come, this isn't asking me questions, so I'm just not going to Oh, right, okay. <laughs> I'm not used okay. to people asking me the questions. Um, <laughs> okay. No, I think, uh, absolutely. I think a valid point there about the non-familiar con connections. Um, how do we, how do we document that? And I don't, you know, I, I think in terms of the, the family tree technology um, across, you know, multiple sites, not just our own, really, you know, isn't always up to par for, for documenting all that, documenting friendships and I items like that. It is very much on, you know, uh, marriages and then children and then a mm. marriage and a children. Yeah. Um, you know, that's how it, it is set up. I mean, luckily I will say, you know, for Find My Past with the, the family tree, you know, I've been able to add my own wife to, to my tree. Um, you know, you can change the gender of spouses and, and those items, but we absolutely have a way to go. Um, and I think that it, it is a challenging question, but it's a very valid question. How do we um, not just Find My Past, but across the family history industry, how mm. do we adapt our trees and keep pushing forward to, um, creating these unique networks and like you said chosen family i think that's a i think that's a really important phrase especially when you're talking about um queer history that mm. oftentimes 
people, LGBT people who, you know, don't find, uh, you know, that that family network that they want within their own biological family do go out and yeah. see their own chosen family. Um, we see that depicted, you know, in, in media and, and items like that of people that, you know, leave home and then they they go to a, and, and live in a house with other people. Um, and that's kind of their chosen family. That's their family yeah. network now because they're no yeah. longer accepted at home and they're no longer accepted by their, their parents or their siblings. Um, and how do we how do we document that? I mean, I don't have a, a, an answer for it, but it is a a very valid conversation that we all should continue to have, whether it is we're talking about LGBT ancestors or not. Um, like you said, you know, your your wonderful story there about your grandfather. Um, how do you document, you know, his friendship or his relationship with this other man who, you know, in whatever terms the relationship was, but mm. it's, he was a very important person in his life. Yeah, clearly. absolutely. You know, yeah. Where do we put, where do we fit them in when we're building these trees and these nodes yeah i mean i mean there's always sort of areas where you can put notes and things like that uh, but even so that is still um not exactly sidelining these people but they're still not sort of front of stage are they actually mm -hmm. on the family tree and i can totally get that would be very very difficult uh, but what is very interesting just as uh, a, an aside on that subject is that and it's an example of how people are changing in terms of their perceptions of family history. I mean, I've been teaching family history since 1988. And in the first, I would say probably 20 years. Oh God, that makes me sound so old. But anyway, I started very young. But when I started, I used to get my students to do a debate on what is family. Because if you don't understand what your perception of family is, then, uh, you know, actually, what are you researching? Um, and to start with, and I would say this applied up to about 2010, 2009, something like that. The, the class used to be polarised almost 50-50. Sometimes before that, the vast majority would say family must be genetic. Um, and uh, so and obviously they include wives and spouses who married into a family who are responsible for children within it. Um, but what I've found now is that the vast majority of people in fact, I've stopped doing this debate because it's pointless. Because I say to people, what is family? Is it chosen family? Has it got to be genetic? And people go, it doesn't matter. Family is what you make it. There's been a massive change in how we perceive family. Mm -hmm. So maybe actually family is catching up with what LGBT people have been doing for a couple of hundred years. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, an amazing question. What is family? And I would love to hear um, some from some of our uh, listeners and, and people watching at the moment what they think I want to um, I want to pull out some of these comments some people are sharing some interesting stories here so uh, Susan has added um, that she remembers when her uncle died and a nun had said to her uh, too bad he never he never married and and she told her um, why he has us nieces and nephews but she did always have that thought in the in the back of her mind that maybe you know it was possible that he he was gay and it's something she'll never know now um but yeah so i, it's, I love the uh, personal stories that people are sharing and then there's another yeah. story here from angie i think is a really a really good one um so my grandmother's cousin was a nun who was uh and was kicked out of her order in the late 80s for having an affair with another nun she's been in the con she had been in a convent since she was 16 in the 1940s. I wish I could have found out more about her, but I doubt the convent would even uh, keep her records of her Ooh, right. records of her indiscretions. <laughs> I, I can honestly say I've never done any research on nuns or convents other than in the Middle Ages. And, and they certainly did get up to all sorts of things then. Um, I, 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 to be honest, Angie, I don't know. Um, I could imagine there might be some sort of disciplinary book but on the other hand, if it was if it was done largely through um, some sort of professional format, then clearly that's going to be confidential. Uh, and would they really want that recorded, um, you know, in their in their records? Because at the end of the day, that is a fail for the abbess or, or whoever dealt with it. So that's a really difficult one. Um, I don't know whether um, the cousin is still alive and whether she will be willing to talk about it but you know that flags up all sorts of um cautionary tales really because not everybody wants to talk about their experiences 
And not everybody wants to talk about the experiences of a close relative either. So I think this is one area like adoption, uh, like illegitimacy still in family history where sensitivity is, is necessary. Uh, and it's one of the things I mentioned in the research guide in the book, because, you know, I would hate anybody to, to, to go into a research projects relating to LGBT family or guns blazing, because just because we don't mind, uh, and we in fact are very happy that we've got queer people in our family, uh, doesn't mean to say all our family are the same. And, uh, you know, when we are networking internationally, with people in, in other continents who have been brought up with different cultural and social values to ourselves, possibly, um, then, you know, it could well be you're hitting on a very, very sensitive subject. And so I always advise caution in any topic like this, really. Uh, but it is an interesting one. And, um, you know, I, I'm going to have to look that up. That's my homework. I'm going to have to find out. How do, how do you find out about lesbianism in convents? That's my homework. <laughs> oh, oh, I would love to see your Google history. Um, <laughs> well, Any story about to... a runaway nun is amazing. Well, one thing I just wanted to mention, actually, as well, Mary, is you were talking about terminology. Uh, and I've just given a talk for the, the little college that I work for on the LGBT history of Cheshire. Uh, and I was looking at the newspaper reports from the 1930s now. So this is 1936. Uh, of um, the uh, the arrest of, I think it was a network of about 30 men in Altrincham in Cheshire, which is just a small sort of um, South Manchester suburb now. And the newspaper reports talk about um, things like unspeakable acts. And if you go back a bit further to what I consider to be the first gay club in Warrington in 1806, which was set up by a cartel of gay men, or what appear to be gay men, uh, they're talking about horrid acts and uh, things like that. So it's never actually spelled out what these men did. So when you're thinking about terminology, it's not just how people might have identified, it's how people referred to what they did. Hmm. And as you know, you know, the British newspaper archive is one of my favourite playthings of all time. And so when you're searching on something like that, you have to be quite liberal in what terms you use to try and flag up these stories. I mean, the easiest one to find is the more recent one of gross indecency. But the further back you go, I mean, they're using all sorts of strange terms to describe um, homosexual offences. Yeah, I think often I have found, especially if you go back to kind of the 18th century uh, phrases, unnatural offences. Um, but I think it's it's really critical, though, for people that if you do find a, a newspaper article that says these kind of unnatural offenses or even gross indecency, um, to follow the story along as well, to mm. see if you can find the court records, to understand more about exactly what they're talking about, because that could cover a wide range of of behaviors yeah. you know yeah. homosexual acts were aligned in the same way in the law's mind as bestiality you know so yeah. you know if you're reading a newspaper article and it says unnatural offenses it could be either um unless you know it has the names of the other people involved or any items like that but once you see that term definitely you know follow that through to double check what is what exactly are we talking about here and often the court records or the the prison register will um at some point explicitly define what happened yeah in that case yeah i think that's one of the good thing about so many things being online now uh, that you can actually see things like sentencing books i think the, mm -hmm. the i think is part of uh, your cheshire collection the sentencing mm -hmm. book for the uh, the chester assizes um, yes. and you can find uh, some of the sentencing for these men in there which is extremely useful um and it, it's interesting how um, in a lot of these newspaper stories, what they're, what, well, certainly in the courts, as it's reported, what they're trying to do is find out who the aggressor is, uh, you know, mm -hmm. in, in, in gay terms, if you like, top and bottom. And they always, generally speaking, tend to penalise the older man more than they would mm -hmm. the younger man because they assume that he's led the younger man astray. Although in the case of the Altrincham men, um, it was actually a 36-year-old who was sort of in the middle of the age range of the men that were arrested. Um, 
who uh, seems to have got the the worst punishment. So whether he was uh, nippy in court or he was a, a known offender or something like mm -hmm. that, I don't know. Uh, but yes, I think trying to follow them through is essential, really. Um, and also, one of the things I've noticed, and this would apply to people who are trying to follow through family history stories, of course, is that after the events, when they've served their time, or even if they've been acquitted through lack of evidence or whatever it is, the difficulty of following these individuals through in the records after that, it, it can be quite considerable because uh, some people are absorbed back into their families without any issues at all. And you can find them in the census and so forth and the 1939 register uh, with their families. Of course, how many arguments were going on, we don't know. Uh, but they're there with their families. They've not been thrown out and it looks as though nothing's happened, apart from possibly losing their job, maybe. Um, but, uh, you know, s sometimes people will not be absorbed back into family or might remove themselves from family. I wouldn't like to say that all individuals were thrown out by family. I don't think that's the case. I think some people actually um, needed to get out uh, in order to um, do what they could to save the family name or to live their own lives or whatever. And then you've got the business of, uh, of people changing their names uh, and becoming quite transient in how they live. And uh, that's one of the things I've noticed is that sometimes people even in the 1930s, will sink without trace because, um, you know, they just don't want to be in the spotlight anymore. Mm -hmm. And even in altering in the 1930s, uh, not just some of the men, but also their spouses as well, are extremely difficult to follow up. And, mm -hmm. you know, these are all conventional family history sources. And if somebody changes their name and everybody's got a right to be known as they want to, um, you know, how are you going to find them? if you don't know what they were using in terms of a name, that's a difficulty. And it crops oh, yeah. up quite a lot in, in, uh, in queer family history. Yeah, definitely a name change is a, is a difficult uh, brick wall to hit at some point. I, I was thinking about when you were talking about following the, the story as well. Um, so there's the, the 1880 masked ball raid in Manchester. Um, so it was an event where there was a, a basically, a, essentially, almost like a drag ball, um, and uh, multiple men were arrested. I think somewhere around 30 men were arrested at the event. Um, it is all in the newspaper mm. and lists all of their names. So it has their their full names, uh, their occupation, and at times their their residence. You know what town they're from. It, not not many of them were actually even from Manchester, but from other areas. Yeah. So I started to look them up in the 1881 census to just try and follow the story along to see where they ended up. And a handful of them, I looked up. You know, some some later were with a, a wife and uh, and a and a home. Um, but then yeah. others I found one. I can't remember the person's name, but one's just struck me um, because in the census it's just um, him living on his own with a border uh, and a male border at that. Yeah. And it made me uh, interested in uh, uh, one of the the pieces that you've pulled out in your book is to talk about how people registered themselves in the census or, or labeled themselves for, for the enumerator who was coming around. And I just want to read out a quote from your book because I think it's really powerful to understand um, how, what, to understand what kind of a world, you know, our ancestors were living in. Mm. So you have the census enumerator come around and you have to create some kind of a definition of whether you're a boarder or a lodger. Very yeah. few people, because of being worried about public exposure, um, and particularly, you know, if I'm talking about the 1881 census, uh, homosexual men um, would have had laws against them. Of course, that wouldn't yeah. be the same for women. As somebody, um, Pauline, in our comments has pointed out that it is much harder to research gay women in the past because, you know, uh, acts between women were not illegal and they're therefore not punishable by, um, yeah, by law. True. But in the in your book, you say um, to feel that you know the, these people would feel compelled to um, dismantle a, a most significant relationship in one's life by hiding it away. So that way, the enumerator, who is often a local minister, or a teacher, or a police sergeant, mm. would not have their attention drawn to anything untoward. Um, but must have been this must have been demoralizing uh, for them to just to say the least you know to think about uh you know in today's terms i could never I, 
I, you know, I'm very fortunate for, for how I live at the moment. I couldn't imagine having to deny, you know, my relationship with my wife and not be able yeah. to um, actually register as to what that is, you know, so in the census records, you won't find somebody to say, you know, my lover, my part, you know, a partner in the terms of how we might describe it. Um, but they might appear as a, a servant or a lodger or, you know, a boarder within the house, but the two of them live together for yeah. consecutive years. Yeah. Time. Yeah. And I think as well, you know, there wasn't really the, uh, the, the features in the census return to describe what were considered to be non-normative relationships. And bearing in mind that up to 1911, what we're actually looking at is the enumerator's version of what your ancestor wrote down. So it could well be even that, uh, you know, LGBT people really did think, right, to hell with it. I'm going to write down that this woman is my wife. I'm going to write down that this man is my life companion or whatever it is. And then the enumerator gets home with his sheaf of papers, sits down with his his glass of port and his oil lamp and he has to start writing out all these forms and he thinks what what this how absolutely ridiculous now i'm changing that to lodger so we've only got the enumerator's version of what our ancestors said up to 1911 so it could have happened yep. but we'll never know absolutely um, i think that's a really key point for people to understand when you're reading the census it's not until 1911 that you actually see what it is that your yeah. ancestor wrote before that, we have what we call it is the sanitized books. So it's yeah. the what the enumerator added. And um, sometimes, you know, they do add their own little comments and, and yeah. <laughs> uh, make their own judgments about families and yeah. add that into. I think that, yeah, that's a really a key point for people to understand about the census records that, yeah, it's not until 1911 that you see the individual's household schedule that your ancestor yeah. actually wrote themselves. Yeah. And, and I think what's sad about it really is that in in effect the the uh, the statisticians and, and that's who the census was for you know the government was not interested in who your ancestors were they didn't give two hoots about them as individuals and probably didn't care what relationships they were in but they needed to fit them into pigeonholes you know they needed to know were you married or or, or not married or are you widowed they didn't care about anything else mm -hmm. and um so uh, it could well be that, um, you know, had the the parameters been wider in terms of how to describe a relationship, that uh, there the could have been more in there of interest to us. But at the same time, uh, and this is the other thing we need to be aware of, descriptors of relationships, if you go back 150 years and, and particularly beyond that, were very, very different. People, particularly women, would refer to each other as sisters and cousins, that sort of thing. And there, there may have been nothing of the sort. Um, and that was a term of affection. Now, to say that somebody is your sister or sister-in-law or in-law or whatever it is on a census return might, I'm not saying it necessarily will, but could be a hint that there is a closer relationship mm. than just landlady and female lodger or something like that. I'll just give you one example, actually, of, um, of something that um, I found quite disappointing. Uh, and it's uh, a woman called Marianne Brocklehurst, who came from an affluent family in Macclesfield in Cheshire, uh, silk manufacturing family. And she never married and had a lifelong um, friend, whatever, partner, uh, who was called Mary Booth. And they're together on virtually every census return, apart from the one where they were in Egypt collecting artefacts. And um, they are not described as anything in particular, really, other than uh, Marianne is um, uh, the head of the household and sometimes Mary is farm manager, visitor, that sort of thing. And then I was very disappointed on one of the census returns and they'd been together 30 or 40 years at this point where uh, Mary is described as Marianne's companion. Mm. And I thought, oh, why? Why did you do that? Why did you demean your relationship and call this woman your companion? But it could have been the enumerator. Maybe mm -hmm. the enumerator was somebody who didn't like that sort of thing. And he mm -hmm. thought, oh, you know, I'm not putting them down as equal family uh, or household uh, members. Mm -hmm. uh, and they could have changed it. We just don't know. So again, it comes back to terminology again, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. If only as I forget who it was now. I apologize for not remembering your name. Somebody said, you know, if only we could do away with all labels. Absolutely. But unfortunately, it, it's it's a human 
it's almost like a human need to want to label people. Mm. That's what the census is. It's labeling people and putting them in the pigeonholes. We have an additional comment from Daphne, who I think was the one previously who, who mentioned about labels as well. Um, so Daphne says, I don't understand why people want to know the sexual preference of their ancestor. Uh, um, is that to label them as other? Um, and then she also points out, or they also point out, maybe good to mention something like context is important, any clues are important, build up a larger picture. And I think, I for just from my point of view, and this is kind of a personal opinion, it's not so much that I would be looking specifically so that way I can say, oh, I have a, you know, a lesbian great aunt or a, a gay uncle or anything like that. It's more about trying to build the full story um, and get a full picture. And like you, Daphne, kind of in your comment about building up the bigger picture and finding all of these clues about what it is that they're their relationship was, what kind of life did they lead. Uh, in our, the, the Find My Past at Home that we had last week, um, talking to Justin Bengry, one of the things that we discussed was people that move to specific er areas um, and then they're single, they live there for a long time, but then once you dig into it, you understand that that, that area actually had a very vibrant gay culture there. Mm. Um, and it's also to understand, yeah, why, why did somebody move there or why did they you know, why were they involved in the social circles that they were as well? Um, and I, for me, yeah, it's not so much about labeling a specific person and trying to put them into a box, but just trying to actually build a full picture of, of a colorful life and, and what it what it meant to them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it's about um, completeness, really. And, you know, Daphne, I will be the last person to say that, um, you know, I would be interested in anybody's uh, sexual or, or private life. And that is not what LGBT family history research is about. Um, and, you know, the whole of my book is about, is, is about relationships. It's about people loving each other, not necessarily homosexuals. And as Mary said, you know, this is a relatively new word. It was used to medicalize people in same-sex relationships. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think the word homosexual has done uh, people a lot of damage with a small d because right in the middle of that word is the word sex you know and people think oh it's all about sex it's not all about sex at all it's much bigger than that and I'm sorry to say Daphne you've hit on one of my massive hobby horses because I am always saying to my students context is all and so you know with any family history projects uh, what you need to do is build the framework that, that actually my other hobby horse is timelines but anyway so you get a timeline for a person and forget whatever it is they did in their private life or anything else get the timeline get the structure there that's what a family tree is but that is all it is that is data so it's names it's it's dates um, you know it's dates of events and where you might find records then and only then you start to build the person's life and you get to know them now they may or may not be um gay uh, cross dressers or whatever it is they may or not be um actively homosexual uh, but that is almost incidentally in a way but at the same time cannot be ignored if it is part of their life so framework first timeline and then context absolutely important so i agree with you daphne on that point and you can't really explore the, uh, the life of a person who has some sort of otherness in their, in their lifestyle, in their relationships, unless you do take context. Because, you know, as we've already said, there are no records that are going to say to you, unless they were in the papers because they were arrested, <laughs> this person was gay or, or this person cross-dressed. Uh, there is an element of, um, what should we say, educated and careful assumption um but again you must never take that too far i think i also want to mention as well we keep talking about court cases if somebody was arrested but we also have to remember that it also people would have been brought to court for um you know for fraud if a if a woman um passes a male um for mm -hmm. for uh, a period of time and again that's not to to label them i don't know if maybe 
they were a cross-dresser, maybe they were transgender, but they had their reasons for, for passing for male um, and then was discovered to be different and then brought into court for fraud. You would also have people brought into court for slander as well. Um, you know, whether that is, you know, somebody, uh, I think you have in your book, and I can't find the page now, so I'm mad that I didn't uh, bookmark it for myself, but a case where um, somebody was brought into court, oh, Margaret, um, Margaret Kerr uh, was brought into the high court for uh, an award of damages of 300 pounds against Adeline, oh, some name here, Adeline Mary Lady John Kennedy, that's, oh, a, yes. that's a great name. <laughs> yeah. um, because she referred to she she referred to Kerr as a lesbian, and this was in 1942. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, damages um for libel and slander and items like that. Like that's other places where you can look to find these kind of evidence. Now, whether or not you know Kerr was actually a lesbian, we don't know, but you know, there was some some evidence or suspect at that point. Yeah. And I think as well that says an awful lot about. Uh, social attitudes towards lesbianism at the time. Uh, the mm -hmm. fact that regardless of the sexuality of the, the women involved, one of them was using the word lesbian as pretty much the ultimate insult. And that's what the judge said, you know, that she, that she really couldn't have accused the other woman of being a worse thing. Uh, and, uh, what you know, the reason that um, women, um, or certainly gay women, um, and their activities have never been illegal in this country is nothing to do with Queen Victoria at all. It, that's a lovely story, uh, but it's got nothing to do with it. Um, it it's actually because in the 1920s, when uh, Parliament was debating whether or not to add lesbian activity to the Criminal Law Amendment Act, which is the one that did for Oscar Wilde, uh, the House of Commons decided that they better not do that because that would just raise the profile of the perversion to the good housewives of Britain, and they might want to give it a go. Um, so uh, it's uh, you know it's just one of those things where it's remained a sort of, in a sense, a social slur. And I have to say, just two counts really. Um, I totally agree that it's more difficult to um, uh, identify lesbian couples, and there's two reasons for that. One is the lack of illegality, which thank God for that. But also, uh, I think because you know, it's never been uncommon for two women to live together for economic uh, companionship, support purposes. Um, and, you know, particularly in the 1920s and 30s, when a lot of men, lots of young men had died during the First World War. Uh, and, you know, the, traditionally there was this shortage of husbands. Uh, women would uh, live together in order to share costs and so forth. And the waters are muddied there because a lot of those women were then referred to as lesbians because they were sharing a home and they might not necessarily have been. So it works the other way as well. You know, just because somebody's uh, living with another individual of the same gender doesn't mean to say that they're in a homosexual relationship, but they obviously like each other well enough to share a home for many years. Yeah, I, and there's also, you know, cases where women for a long time would live together and remain single because once they got married, they would have to leave their profession. Um, so yeah. they, they love teaching or what other profession they were in, you know, they chose chose that vocation over over Absolutely, anything yeah. else. I love yeah. that you brought up the, the parliamentary debate in the 1920s. I haven't read a lot of parliamentary debates, but that is one I absolutely recommend reading. It is it's very funny. It's so fantastic to <laughs> sit and watch yeah. um, these MPs debate about whether to even allow women to know that lesbianism exists yeah. uh, and, and to try and keep it hidden. So I, I think we're, we're getting uh, to the top of the hour here. So um, I want to I want to go back to the comments, um, maybe answer one or two more questions if we have time. Mm. So there's a comment here from Rosie, I think is interesting. So Rosie says, had I not found a cousin had changed name from male to female um, and found out through a deed poll in the uh, and the 1939 register, I would not have been able to find out what happened to him after his birth and and marriage. Um, it's not labeling, um, you know, labeling this person to know that. It's just finding out more about the, the person's life. Um, so yeah. luckily, yeah. So, Yeah, I, I agree. You know, um, it, it is a really difficult subject, this business of semantics and labels and things like that. Uh, but a name is a label, and we've all got names, haven't we? 
And, uh, you know, how am I going to describe myself? If somebody said to me, you know, what is your relationship status? I could say I'm a lesbian or something like that. Uh, or I could say, well, actually, uh, I am a natal female and I am attracted in a romantic and sexual sense to other women uh, who are also attracted to women. And you could just go on and on and on. So it's just easy to say I'm gay or I'm lesbian, <laughs> whatever it is. Uh, so, you know, I'm quite happy to label myself like that. Uh, and, you know, I agree that things like, um, you know, obviously changes of name and um, you know, professions are a label. We've got to have them. And really, what would family history be without it? You know, we, we'd just spend forever trying to write down what we thought people were and who they were uh, without those labels. So, yeah, very good point. And I think... I. We also label people in other ways. I mean, we easily say, oh, my great grandfather was a minor and that's it. That that was yeah. his whole life, a minor. But that's not true. You know, there's so much true, more yeah. to his life than that. Yeah. Um, so I think there's all kinds of labels that we do put on our ancestors. But um, I think, again, it comes back to building a bigger story, to building that wider context. I, I love, you know, that you, your, your passion about building context. And I think that's really important. Too. Yeah. I mean, shows like Who Do You Think You Are? I mean, the success of it is finding that ancestor and placing them into a moment in history in their yeah. local community and what is happening around them and understanding that. Yeah. And that's how you understand Absolutely. who your ancestor was and what they lived day to day. Yeah. And, and you do that for every ancestor. So, I mean, if, if you if you think about when I was a kid, we used to have gobstoppers. And in the middle of a gobstopper, which was multi-layered um, uh, boiled sweets, which took about three hours to eat. Mm -hmm. uh, there was an aniseed, an aniseed right in the middle of it. And your ancestor is the aniseed. And then all those layers are the context for that person's life. And th that is absolutely no different, whatever somebody's sexuality or gender presentation. I think what it is with queer family history is that there are maybe one or two added layers to the gobstopper because you've got to really look at the social context that somebody's in and and also the legal framework that they existed within as well you know wh what was the legal status of somebody who was uh, considered to be procuring in 1920 uh, and that's no different to any ancestor who let's say ended up falling on hard times whatever the legal framework of poor relief was at any given time let's say either before or after the Watershed Poor Relief Act of 1834, that is going to affect the authorities' response to that person, what happened to them, their own expectations and fears of uh, the society in which they lived. Um, so it's actually not that much different to researching any other person in family history. It's just that the context is slightly different. But at the same time, you've got all the other usual contexts of poor relief, of voter status and that sort of thing. And also, I mean, where do you stop? You know, so many LGBT people in the past and today are married or have been married. And, uh, you know, that, that opens a whole other um, form of discussion because as I said in the book, you know, one of the, and you said as well, Mary, that one of the guys from the drag board subsequently got married and had mm -hmm. a child. Now you may think to yourself, well, that's absolutely dreadful. But fancy him using that young woman uh, to do that and to sort of cover him his tracks and so forth. Not necessarily. They they could have loved each other dearly in their own way. Relationships are very very complex things, and um, you know his wife could have been fully aware of mm -hmm. uh, his background. It could well be that he was having casual relationships. And I just don't know. No, we will never know. Uh, but just because. He married her doesn't mean he was a bad person and it doesn't mean to say she didn't know and that they weren't happy. There's all sorts out there. And that's one of the things we've got to be aware of. Family history uh, in the past and families today are complex. Absolutely. I think that's a I think that's a great place to to stop today's call. I have to say, I mean, I've definitely heard about 
different layers of people like as in an onion but i've never heard it as a gobstopper and i think that that should be it for now i think yeah it should, we should be talking about gobstoppers more often uh, rather than peeling the layers of an onion um joe i want to just say again thank you so much for joining us um, well, everybody you. that that stayed on to watch and everybody that added in yeah, questions and listening. comments amazing amazing session today sorry we haven't been able to answer everything um to to bring up all the comments but please yeah. everybody that's on the call read the other comments there's some fantastic stories in there and yeah, uh, really we interesting have... stuff thank you for sharing everybody it's been great fun it has so and yeah on that note i just want to say we have more um broadcasts coming up over the rest of the month i think we have another discussion next week about lgbt history so please join us again and thanks Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.